You are listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast, where we look to educate and entertain the endurance racing community through discussions with racing professionals and elite age groupers. In today's episode, I speak with Paul Terranova. He is someone who has done adventure races, qualified and competed at Kona multiple times, and has done many ultra marathons. One of his claims to fame includes the Grand Kona Slam, which is in 16 weeks, he completed four mountain 100 mile ultra marathons and the Kona Ironman. I hope you enjoy. Paul, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Adam. Thank you. So let's start off. Walk me through your athletic background. How did you get into endurance sports? Well, let's see. So uh, the best place to start is probably at Cornell uh, as a walk-on lightweight rower. I had played tennis in high school and played a little soccer and, and some basketball. So I wasn't really that much of an endurance athlete, but running to and from the boathouse to get to practice for four years, you end up uh, at the end of that being a pretty good runner just to get down to practice and then get back up to campus. I know those uh, hills. To to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to make it to the dining hall before it closes because you're famished from practice. So, uh, so yeah, at, at the end of that, when I graduated, um, I knew that uh, a marathon and some distance running was in my future. And do you think uh, the rowing itself kind of helped lend itself to being an endurance athlete in terms of learning how to suffer, I guess you would say, because it's a pretty intense sport and obviously building that cardio base? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, that's some of the hardest, uh, training that you can do, uh, cause it taxes, right? Not just your legs, but your back and your arms. And so, uh, yeah, that, uh, that training, um, both on the water and then indoors, cause we trained all year round. So winter training, we were indoors, either indoor tanks or on the concept two ergometers. Mm-hmm. which you've probably seen at the gym. Yeah. And those are some pretty good torture devices. And then <laughs> uh, strength work as well. So we were lifting weights um, and running. And, uh, yeah, that was winter training. And even uh, spring break, we'd be uh, breaking ice just to get on the water because spring racing season was uh, shortly after spring break. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. We actually had a, a previous guest on this show who was a rower uh, at Cornell, actually, Doug McLean. He's a professional triathlete, and he was sort of talking about just how those, uh, you know, the rowing in itself just helped him learn how to suffer and really kind of gave him that that men- mental strength that he needed to, to kind of get into. Obviously, he, he's focusing on triathlons, but any endurance uh, sport for that matter. That discipline, particularly when you're in a boat, because uh, we rode in eight eight person shells that, uh, yeah, yeah. You're locked in with, uh, seven other guys and a coxswain and, uh, going at it, right. A 2000 meter race is probably six minutes or so, but it's an intense six minutes. So oh yeah. A lot like running a mile event or, uh, right. Steeplechase or something like that. So, um, I credit a lot of what I've done since then to those formative years uh, at Cornell. Yeah. I, speaking of the mile, I, I did a mile race this year, uh, the fifth Avenue mile in New York city, uh, two weeks after my Ironman this year. And, uh, I was still, you know, kind of a little bit sore, just, I guess had some lactic acid still in there. And my photos, if you compare my photos between my one mile race and my Ironman, I looked in a lot more pain in that one mile race, <laughs> you know, that six minutes yeah. of hell but <laughs> for me at least, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to get, to get to the shorter distance, races right you're still doing two three hour workouts sometimes but just a lot of those pieces and in rowing we call them pieces you know a two minute piece a three minute piece a four minute piece much like in running or mile you're doing a 400 meter piece or 800 meter intervals or if you're doing by time whether it's 90 seconds or two minutes or three minutes or or four minutes so there's a lot of commonality between the two sports Right. And so after college, you went on, you were in the ROTC, so you went on to the military and I understand you were a graduate of Ranger School. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah, that- I got the opportunity to go. I didn't go right after graduation. Uh, I went when I was a captain. So I, I already had four years of active duty service under my belt. I had been a, a, a platoon leader, executive officer, so I had some experience of so going to ranger school. That was the summer of 2000 was uh, a lot of fun. 
Yeah. Actually, believe it or not, a lot of people suffer, and of course we suffer. But when you have a good amount of experience and you're there with a with a good group of guys, then uh, it makes it makes all the suffering worth it. Yeah, because I was going to ask. It's a notorious suffer fest from from what I hear. I have some friends who went through it. So, I mean, I'm sure. Again, is that another experience that helped build that mental strength that you've now applied to some of the amazing things you've done in in endurance sports? It did. It did. And prior to that. Uh, when I was at Fort Hood, Texas, um, I took I was the officer in charge of taking a group to what's called the Sapper Leader Course, which is an engineer-specific uh, mini ranger course of sorts. It's, it's about 30 days long at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, but steeped in light infantry and light combat engineer tactics. So I got to take a combined arms team of because uh, I was supporting mechanized infantry, so I got to take a master gunner, got to take a scout, a commo guy, a medical guy, and then um, engineers from my home unit at Fort Hood. So uh, we had about uh, 25, 30 people go through that. So that was must have been the summer of 98 or so. So that was a good precursor to, to Ranger School as well. So having that and then having... Just the four years of experience uh, prior to going uh, paid off. Right. And so then you eventually get into endurance sports. And, you know, I joked with you before we actually started recording, but I, that you're my dream guest because, you know, I cover on this podcast adventure racing, triathlons, ultra marathons. You've done it all. So, you know, help me uh, kind of understand, uh, you know, compare and contrast those three sports for me a little bit. And then ultimately, why did you gravitate towards really kind of mainly focusing on ultra running? Yeah. So while I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, one of my classmates, was into triathlon and encouraged me to get out on a bike and go for some bike rides with him and some swimming. And I did. And I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. I think I could, I could do this. And, uh, it, and then I got out or off of active duty, uh, in 2001 and moved to Houston, Texas. And that's when I got back into, into marathon running and I had dabbled in some running here and there while I was in the military, but it wasn't until I was a civilian, started my civilian career, and then got into marathon running in Houston that a couple of the people that I trained with, they were also adventure racing. And so they asked me to be on their co-ed team, and I was like, hey, sure, that's, that's great. And I borrowed a mountain bike from one of my teammates, and simultaneously while training for the marathon, also doing some kayaking and some mountain biking. Yeah. (laughs) That's how I got into adventure racing even before, um, I got into triathlon. So that was a a neat evolution and not until, um, my wife, she was my fiance at the time moved to Austin, Texas. Did I really get into triathlon? And I had done my first triathlon in 2002 in Houston or just outside of Houston, just a little sprint one called the Cinco Ranch Triathlon and had a blast. And I think the most memorable thing of that was I forgot my race belt with my bib number in P2. <laughs> so I get probably quarter mile out of transition and realize I forgot my bib number and run back into transition and pick it up and, and then continue on. But I had so much fun. Something like that has happened to all of us, I think, you know, you know, first yeah. few times in the race, you know, transitions like, wait, what am I supposed to do? Uh, the best is, of course, I'm sur- sure you've seen it is when someone leaves their bike helmet on and starts running, uh, <laughs> that you should get caught right. pretty quickly, but that, that's always funny. <laughs> right. Or they have their bike helmet on backwards. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Seen that a couple of times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> volunteering at, at races and, and you can see some funny stuff coming out of T1 and T2. Oh, yeah moving to Austin in 2004 and then getting plugged into the multi-sport community here. Uh, my adventure race teammates, we, we continued to race on and off cause they were still in Houston, but they were starting to raise families and have kids. And so logistically it wasn't as easy to train and race together. And then I just gravitated towards triathlon and boy, the community here at that time was, um, was huge and, Getting into Hawaii Ironman 
was uh, top of the list. Uh, first thing, uh, so I did my first Ironman, yeah, shortly after moving to Austin in 2004, that was Ironman Coeur d'Alene, and then uh, did Buffalo Springs, uh, half Ironman the year after in 2005, and punched my first ticket to Kona awesome. there for 2005, so that was just absolutely, uh, what a what a gift, but I put I put so much work into that, getting ready for it that uh, there was really uh, no doubt in, in my mind when I told the line there that I was going to have a, a great race. And then how did you ultimately get into ultra running and, and, you know, kind of what, how did that evolve? What was that evolution like? Yeah. Yeah. Which is even, even more interesting because Meredith, my wife, she was fully into ultra running at the time. And in fact, at Buffalo Springs, she was in Squaw Valley in Auburn, pacing a friend of hers at Western States oh, the wow. same day <laughs> as Buffalo Springs. So she was she was not there at the finish line, but instead she was out pacing her friend Shan to her first Western States finish. And so Meredith was on the ultra bug. You know, she had the Western States fever full bore, and so she would she would go out to California um, by herself do a hundred K on a Saturday and then take the red eye home Saturday night and then come and cheer me on and support me at some, some rinky dink trap line on <laughs> Sunday here, here in Austin, which now that I've, now that I've done some ultras, I was like, wow, that was really selfless of her Oh yeah, to do that. And, and to get on a red eye flight after, after running a 50 miler or hundred miler out in California, boy, that's, she's, she's one tough cookie. Yeah, she was doing uh, ultras, and I thought she was off a rocker. I, really, I thought, oh, like, 50 miles, 100K, 100 miles? You're off your rocker. I'm going to stick to uh, long course triathlon. And then a couple of years later, right here I am doing doing the same thing. And so uh, I certainly understand her passion at the time for uh, for ultra running. Nowadays, you pretty much, you know, exclusively focus on ultra running. And what what was that kind of thought process there in terms of, uh, you know, leaving that long course Ironman racing and, and now focusing on obviously 100 milers and 50 Ks and 50 milers, that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so after 2005, my first trip to Hawaii, then I went to visit school at night uh, in the e- evening program here at UT at the Macomb School of Business. So so triathlon took a little bit of a back burner, although I was still training just to keep my sanity and some fitness. And uh, did Ironman Arizona in 2008, which was at the conclusion of my uh, MBA program, and punched my ticket again for Hawaii for the following year, 2009. And then, uh, yeah, I was traveling for work up to Dallas, for a little while and then switch firms to come back to Austin. And, uh, yeah, then Meredith started getting the bug for it and she got into some long distance swimming. Uh, there's an organization here called Collins Hope and they raise awareness for preventing childhood drowning, which is the number one cause of death for kids under five. Oh, wow. And so she got involved with that, some long distance swimming. And then she said, Hey, well, I'd, l- I'd like to try an Ironman at some point. So she talked me into uh, her signing up for Ironman Cozumel in 2011. Uh, and she said, hey, well, why don't you do it as well? And I said, okay, well, I'll go do it. And so so we trained for that and uh, qualified. Uh, again, we both had really good races. And uh, then, because that was Thanksgiving of 2011, and then when we got back, I had put my name in the lottery for Western States and I got in on the first try via lottery for the 2012. Wow. <laughs> talk about so luck. That was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You talk about, but that was, that was right er, early on where your chances True. of getting yeah. in first time were uh, higher than they were today. So I, I am really, really fortunate that that convergence of events happened like it did. Right. And then, so in 2012, you were going to take on your first 100 miler, but that wasn't enough for you. So you did four 100 <laughs> milers for 
what you call the uh, Kona Grand Slam or the Grand Kona Slam, I, I suppose. Which uh, can you just explain that for us a little bit? Because that you are the I think the only person who's ever done it. So there's been more people to the moon than there has to do what you did in 2012. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, framing it like that. And um, we had here in Texas, we have a couple friends that had done the slam, and I always loved hearing their stories of that summer that they did it. Um, Doug. And at the time, his girlfriend, Shan, you know, crewed for him. And just just hearing the stories uh, of going from Western States to Vermont, to Leadville, to Wasatch, that uh, that was always something in my mind that, hey, if I ever get the chance, I want to take a, take a crack at that. That really sounds like uh, it, it would be a fun summer. And, hey, the stars align that I got into Western States and Meredith was on board with us adding on three more ultras, Vermont, Leadville, and Wasatch, and then tacking on uh, the Hawaii Ironman World Championship at the end of that. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, looking back, it just all worked really, really well, and I got stronger remarkably as the, as the races went on, and so Wasatch was probably one of my, one of my best races of that year. So if I do the math right, I think that's all within, what, four months, something like that uh, time period. So you did 400 milers and uh, and the Kona Ironman <laughs> in, in a four-month period of time. So, I mean, that's that's incredible. So how, how did you address uh, recovery and injury prevention doing, you know, doing that much endurance uh, stuff in a short period of time? Yeah, that's a good question, Adam, because I think having... The Ironman after Wasatch forced me to swim and bike in between those 100-mile races. And so that serves as great recovery. Oh, yeah. One is that it gets you in the pool and some easy bike rides the first week or second week after each event and kept kept me injury-free. And, of course, my relationship with my physical therapist uh, Dr. Z at, uh, at, the, at the time was, uh, advanced rehab. Um, it's now little, little river health, healthcare clinic and chiropractic, but, you know, regular visits to your physical therapist who knows, knows you when you're healthy and then can, can get you back to your baseline. And then regular massage is, is definitely a piece of that combined with the easy, easy swimming, easy biking, um, and then, and then getting back on your feet as well for some running, um, was the key plus, plus nutrition, right? Meredith is a dietitian, And so, uh, lots of, lots of really good lean protein, uh, definitely helps. Yeah. That's, that can't be discounted the nutrition side of things. And I think a lot of people neglect that, but the more and more I talk to people who, kind of have long-term success in endurance sports and and do things like what you did with the uh the grand kona slam the, the, they always highlight nutrition being one of those key factors so it's definitely something people should pay attention to for sure so um one thing i always like to do on this podcast is just highlight or talk a little about some races and you know i've talked to other guests about western states and leadville but we actually have never covered uh, vermont or wasatch um would you just kind of describe those two for us how do they differ from the other two and and especially i'm an east coast person so i'd love to hear a little bit about the vermont 100 uh, and how that differs from you know those races out in the rockies and and you know the western mountain ranges there's so many people that think of Vermont 100 and they think, oh, it's flat. It's it's nowhere near the amount of climbing as you're going to get in a California race or Colorado race or Utah race. But that's uh, that's a tough one because it's just always either going up or down, and a lot of it is on uh, on some gravel roads, and it's humid, right? East Coast in the summer in July is awfully humid. Oh yeah. <laughs> so so you you've got to be ready for that. Um, I think the cool thing that I tell people about the Vermont 100 is it coincides with the horse, the horse endurance ride at the same time, which is, which is where ultra running draws its lineage with the Tevis cup. And so that's always neat to share some of the same trails with the, with the horses and their riders. And I remember being at the pre-race briefing and the horses are going through their, their check-in and, uh, I think they're getting body marked with spray paint on the sides of their, 
of their body. So that was a, a neat experience to, uh, to go through there. And, uh, I had the, I had the luxury Glenn Redpath. He's a runner out of New York city, but he had done Vermont and he was gracious enough to come up to Vermont and do some pacing for me along with Meredith, um, who was crewing and pacing for me. So I had some, had some local, uh, knowledge to help me out and keep me, keep, keep me running up those short, short little hills, uh, even late in the game. Right. And you're, you're, you're from Texas. So you're a flatlander, um, in terms of, uh, you know, obviously for altitude. So did you find Vermont being lower altitude than obviously Leadville and, and the others to be a little bit more manageable for you or was it, or did that not really factor in? Uh, it was, it was a non-issue, right? It definitely helped, uh, that it, it, isn't at altitude, so you don't have to acclimate or don't have to worry about about that. I do know coming at the at the time, I think it was three weeks after Western my year that my legs were still sore at the start line of Vermont. So they started off sore. The good thing is that is that they never got appreciably worse throughout the day. Um, and that was my that was my first run in Hoka's, believe it or not, or my first race in Hoka's because after after Western States, uh, boy, yeah, my legs hurt. Gosh, if I've got to go run three more of these, I've got to find a new solution. And so the Bondi Bees uh, had come out, and AJW had made a recommendation to give those a try, and uh, I'm certainly glad I did. Yeah. So you felt that made the difference uh, in that race to help kind of dampen the uh the soreness a little bit i suppose it it did it did and i i alternated between a pair of bondies and some brooks launch which those those were my road road running shoes at the time because a lot of vermont is on uh on gravel country roads so i flip-flopped back and forth a couple times and that worked out great yeah i'm always impressed when uh someone coming off some other race who has soreness still comes in and, and performs. I, I was at a, a race a number of years ago. Uh, a gentleman did the Lake Placid Ironman the week before, and he you know, he won his age group, and then he came to Cayuga Lake Tri, which is uh, in, in uh, Ithaca, where Cornell is, and he came in second place there. And what was interesting was at the beginning of the race, when he was setting up his transitionary, he was limping and sore, could hardly move. I'm like, how is this guy going to do it, you know, do anything? And then he goes out there and comes in second. So it's amazing what people can do if they have the mental uh, toughness, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. When you put your mind to doing something like that, that, and once you get moving, right, the body has a phenomenal ability to, to keep going at that level. And I had somewhat prepared for it, let's see, um, my first, or one of my first times doing the Bandera 50K, and then followed it up, which was on a Saturday, and then we drove to Houston to go, uh, I was asked to help pace the women's Olympic B group, uh, getting ready for the, must have been the 2008 Olympics, so they were qualifying, so it must have been January of 2008. Uh, so I did the 50 K ran that, and then we drove to Houston and then I ran 25 K at, uh, at the time, the, the women's B standard, it was either 247 or 246. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a good test to, to run fast on fatigue legs. Oh yeah. <laughs> so speaking of Bandera, let's talk about 2017 a little bit. And, um, you know, what are your plans for 2017? You obviously, the reason I mentioned Bandera is you won the 50K a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, that's a hell of a way to start 2017. So what, what, what else is in store for your, for your season? Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and normally, right, the past five years, I've done the 100K at Bandera. That's been, that's been my MO the last five years is do Bandera 100K, kick off the season early, and then get ready for states in June, and uh, I'm not not in for states for this year, and um, I had put in for San Juan Solstice 50 miler, which I did not get into. I think I'm 95th on the wait list, so my chances of getting in to that are slim to none. Yeah. Um, because ul- ultimately, um, 
I want to I want to get into hard rock. I've never done hard rock and uh, go after the Rocky Mountain Slam. So right. hopefully that'll be on tap for 2018. But until then, right now, um, I know for sure I'll be pacing the Awesome Marathon, the three hour group, in the middle of February. And uh, TDS is uh, one of the sister UTMB races in late August. Right. So that's a 119 kilometer race. So we'll uh, we'll go out for that, and uh, this will be my first time racing in Europe. So I'm totally stoked about that. And Lake Sonoma 50. Yep. So uh, do that in April, and then um, yeah, right now I'm I'm still filling in the gaps between now and Lake Sonoma, and uh, and between Lake Sonoma and uh and tds and i've added uh jason coop with uh cts coaching um added him to the team and so he's been helping me uh chart a little different path uh than what i've done in past years right so i'm really really thrilled to be uh to be part of part of that team and uh yeah looking forward to great things not just this year but in 2018 Sounds sounds amazing and sounds like a heck of a plan. And I um, wish you the best of luck with Hard Rock next year or, or whenever you apply again for the lottery and, and get to do that uh, Rocky Mountain uh, Grand Slam, which which is, remind me, it's uh, Hard Rock, um, Bighorn, The Bear, and then Leadville, is, it, is that right? Yeah, so, it's, so the two that you have to do are Hard Rock and The Bear, and then you can pick two of the three, Bighorn, Leadville, or Wasatch. Um, so you can either do four or you can do all five. So uh, obviously, being the overachiever that I am, I'd like to do all five. Yeah, I was going to say that I <laughs> I don't know you very well, but I know you well enough to know that that's definitely would be your choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that'll be a big summer uh, whenever that happens, and uh, and who knows? Maybe maybe there's a, a triathlon or or an Ultraman at the end of that that could make it interesting. Yeah, it would be amazing. The Ultraman is definitely, for those not familiar with it, can you just walk us through that real quick? It's out on the big island, and it's basically kind of a double Ironman, right? Multi-day. It is. It is. It's about two and a half Ironmans over three days, and, and my wife, Meredith, has finished it uh, 2014 and then just this past year. So I've been out there twice to crew and pace her. And uh, day one is a 10K swim and a 90 mile bike and finishes on the east side of the island in volcano. And then day two is a 170 mile bike plus or minus finishing on the north end of the island in Javi. And, uh, then day three is a double marathon all the way back to Kona. Yeah. So you get to run on the bike course of the Ironman world championships. It's a great experience even just to, just to crew it and be be around those people and the uh, and the culture that the, that they have it's uh it's synonymous somewhat with the ultra running community that uh that was around you know 10 15 20 years ago and continues to this day but uh just a small group of people who like to go out and suffer together yeah yeah, it sounds great. So, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's been really interesting to hear about some of your stories. And, and obviously, you've done some amazing feats. But it's also, I always love talking to someone who kind of has done it all. So, you know, the adventure racing, the triathlon and, and ultra running. And it's kind of a, a man after my own heart. So I, it's really uh, something I, uh, you know, aspire to do one day. And I look up to you for everything you've done so far. So thank you so much. Thank you. And you're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit www.intelligentracer.com. Also, be sure to check us out on social media and please review us on your podcast directory. Join us next time for another edition of the Intelligent Racer.